everyone. Good morning, everyone. It is Christy. It is Saturday. I hope you are doing well. I'm doing very well. Thank you very much. Today I am relaxing. I had, um, well, an intense week. Not a like, well, not an intense week per se. Not that I should reserve for things that are actually like stressful and things. Uh, we had the kickoff to Carnival here in Cologne, which is always kind of a weird time for me as an atheist because, you know, like, I don't actually, like, believe in any of these rituals, and yet I take part. Um, but then again, I, I look around at the people around me. It's a very secular society here in, in Cologne, and there's a, a lot of people who are having a good time based on these ancient traditions, these ancient rituals. Uh, yeah, so we I had a, a sort of a short week. I had Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, decided to take off on the Thursday, really embrace carnival this year, which means uh, I had to negotiate with the woman that uh, I met up with. She came over here. Uh, we walked together to the next event, which is about 10 minutes from my house. But when uh, she wanted to arrive at at my door at 8.30 in the morning to start, like, you know, basically be drinking by nine and I have to say, one of the pleasures in my life, one of the things that I treasure more than anything else, <laughs> this is not a lie, but when I get to go to bed on a Friday night or the night before a holiday and I don't have to set my alarm clock, <laughs> that to me, <laughs> I know it's a silly thing and it's a small thing, but the idea of waking up naturally whenever my body decides it's had enough sleep. I find that really luxurious. It's a thing that I really enjoy a lot. And so, yes, the idea of actually having to like sort of get up and be ready to get out the door by 8.30 in the morning on my day off. Mm. That's not a day off to me. <laughs> that's not a day off. That's, that's just a different day of work. I'm just like working at something else. So I, I negotiated with her. We pushed it back till closer to 10. That way I could have my leisurely morning, get up, you know, not feel rushed. And she got here a little bit after 10 and we, we went over and met up with some of her friends. If you've been on my Facebook page, you'll have seen uh, some of the pictures. Um, I had my delicious carnival breakfast, which consisted of <laughs> um, Prosecco in a plastic champagne flute. We, we, that was pretty much what we did in the morning. We didn't do beer until afternoon. We did mostly Prosecco. And I had a lovely glass of Prosecco. Uh, well, no, I didn't. I had drinkable Prosecco, which is the only kind of Prosecco I care about. As long as it's drinkable, <laughs> that's good enough for me. I had that and my bratwurst. And that was my carnival breakfast because I got up and had coffee and sort of tidied the flat. My friend, I, I, well, she's my friend now, but when I first met her, she was the woman I actually moved in with and rented a room from when I first got to Cologne. And that was in 2011. And, you know, we're still friends and we still hang out a few times a year, especially carnival time. She really enjoys showing off the city to me. And uh, I kind of forgot where I was going with this. I get distracted on all these little side stories. But uh, yeah, so we got there and uh, did our thing. We had the Prosecco. We had the Cologne stuff. Um, she is a, a real hardcore partier. For me, I had to uh, about, f let's see, started at 10, um, stayed at the sort of the plots where they were having bands, which was Cologne music, uh, Schlager. I think is the correct pronunciation of music that you play at Carnival. It's it's a lot of 4-4 four, four time, you know, sort of just bebopping. It's not very funky music. It's like a sort of uh, either like a polka music, uh, sort of one, two, three, one, two, three, or a kind of a 4-4 four, four time music. And so we did our thing and yeah, got uh, two o'clock, maybe 2.30, headed over to a different venue and she came back to mine changed. Oh yeah, that was right. I was cleaning up my apartment. That was where I was going. Was because Z Zandra was going to be as my friend. There's lots of Zandras in Germany, so it's not like I'm doxing her in any meaningful way. <laughs> but if you um yeah, when I when I was at her house, I felt even though I was renting a room, it wasn't really my house and uh, so I always um looked to her examples of cleanliness and she was a bit of a neat freak. So her standards of cleanliness was what I always aspired to, but her standards of cleanliness is, are, are a little bit overly picky from mine. Like uh, on a weekly basis, sort of taking a toothpick and running it along the sink, the sort of the seam, you know, where like the sink and the 
countertop run flush or similar to that like around the oven you know just to like catch any extra like i can just use a cloth and and wipe that off and wash it off and be fine with it but uh so i had got up uh, had my leisurely breakfast or well, actually, i just had like le- leisurely coffee while i got myself ready and i got my flat ready one last polishing up before zendra arrived then when after we finished the plots events from like 10 till about 2 then she came back here we we changed a little bit because we would move from an outdoor venue which was it was like one degree celsius so that's just above freezing in fahrenheit and we were going to an indoor facility indoor party where it was just going to be you know humid because of all the people talking and the body sort of slammed into a small space I took, I had to take a nap. I, you know, like, I, I've, I've got a four hour max. Took my little nap, um, went to a Kneipa um die Ecke, a, a bar around the corner. There's actually a party going on in my neighborhood, really close by my house. That's where she wanted to party. So I met her up there, did like, I managed another hour and a half <laughs> this time of Kosh. And then, like, all right, that's it. Like, I'm, I need to, I'm, I'm tired uh, because it just makes me really sleepy. So that was my kickoff to carnival. Yesterday was a little more sedate, uh, just because you need a recovery day. And today I'm recording this, but I will be heading out. There are uh, parades going on over the weekend. There's the big uh, Rosenmontag parade, the uh, Rose Monday, where they really just fill up the cities with like hours and hours of, of parades to celebrate near the end of carnival. And then, of course, Tuesday night, will be at midnight, the burning, the Nubu burning, where you scapegoat all the things you did wrong onto the Nubu, which is like a straw man, straw woman, straw person. And you you blame the Nubu for everything you've done, and then you take it out into the street, and you burn it, and then all your sins are gone. <laughs> that's carnival. I tell the story every year, because that's the same story every year. So for those of you who are longtime fans, you're probably bored by now. But for those of you who haven't heard the story of how we celebrate Carnival here in Cologne, or Colonia, or Cologne, all of them are right. <laughs> uh, that's that's it. I, I love the tradition. I, of course, don't have to deal with a lot of the drunken people. I don't have to deal with the, you know, uh, plastic glasses and the carnage on the streets that come afterwards. But they've done so many carnival parties here. The city uh, has a really good system down. They, they drunk proof it by putting up big plywood sort of barriers around places where drunk people would be tempted to sit and fall over backwards and hurt themselves. So we sort of drunk proofed the city and then they come and clean it every night. And then I, you know, I pay very high taxes in Germany. I'm sure a lot of Americans would complain about the level of tax that I have to pay. And especially being single and without kids, I have no <laughs> deductions <laughs> whatsoever. You know, So I'm sort of at the maximum tax rate. And yet I see my tax dollars at work. I see it in the form of good public transportation that's incredibly cheap. Yeah, so I don't, I don't really mind. And that was another thing, I guess, before we get into the uh, uh, of Trump, um, I want to, uh, yeah, just sort of say a little bit about the other thing that I really like about Carnival, and it ties in a bit to that appreciation of the small thing of not having to set an alarm that, that I find joy in. And one of the things that I appreciate most about having lived in Germany, the perspective that I've been given that's very different from what I was socialized to be, socialized into as an American is this notion of where where do you find contentment? Where do you find your happiness? And growing up in the States, consumer culture bombarded all the time with commercials. Buy this product, it will make you happier. Take this pill, it will make you skinnier. Buy your shaken, what is it, shake weighty uh, to tone your arms and get rid of flab. Everything is built, all that advertising is built around making you feel less confident about who you are, making you want to buy something to make you better because you're flawed, and really putting your sense of self-worth, <laughs> your sense of self-worth into the judgment of others. That's kind of what I took away from my American culture. Like the, not, you know, like necessarily what 
real people think. But if you look at the culture and the advertising and the way people talk about themselves and gym memberships and health kicks and there's a lot of that sort of self-obsession. I'm not saying that doesn't exist in Germany. However, I would say that uh, like the British who are also just more realistic about looks and your body and a bit more just down to earth about it, the Germans too are, are very down to earth and practical about you know, accepting that the human body isn't always going to look like somebody on Baywatch. That there's a, you know, and uh, especially when I've gone to, you know, like the spas, just the level of comfort that people have with whatever body shape or whatever age they are. You know, the number of 70-year-old men and women I've seen padding around the, the sauna area naked, wrinkles and all, just everything hanging down, just sort of sagging. You're like, you know what? We're all going to get there if we're lucky enough. We're all going to be, if we're lucky enough to get to that age, um, into a body type like that. So why why pretend that it's wrong? Why become obsessed with preventing something that's entirely natural? That I appreciate a lot. The other thing that I appreciate is the fact that they do put emphasis on finding happiness in things that are, it sounds maybe patronizing, but simple. Things like meeting up with your friends <laughs> and having fun with your friends. The, the notion of you know, the, the Christmas markets where you go and you, they're only there for four weeks and then they close down and they're gone. So if you don't go and have your Glühwein or have whatever Christmas market food you like, if it's some Reibkuchen or, you know, some smoked salmon from a fresh, you know, like fire in the middle and not like an open fire, but, a, you know, like in a, in a little glass house, smoking house kind of thing. Uh, whatever it is that it crepes, warm crepes made in front of you while your nose is cold and your fingers are numb, but then you put the warm crepe in your mouth and maybe you go really simple and you just have basic sugar and cinnamon in a, inside a warm crepe. You know, these are, you don't need a lot of money to buy a crepe for two euros or three euros. You don't need a lot of money to meet your friends at the Christmas market. Uh, you don't need a lot of money when it's time for the white asparagus madness that takes over about uh, May of, of every year. And you suddenly, it's called Spargel. You just have Spargel everywhere. Restaurants are like just serving buttered Spargel and Spargel soup and this Spargel and that Spargel. It just becomes Spargel madness. And then it's gone. By July, you can't get that kind of Spargel anymore. The simplicity plus the limited nature, the fact that it's time sensitive, the I guess the best word I think is ephemeral. It exists for a little while and then it's gone. And that ability to connect with things like uh, your fur, you know, the tasting glue vine again for the first time in a year because you had the Christmas markets have been closed that long, or the Spargel time, or um, Carnival, just the five you know days of Carnival and then it's over. These little things, these routines, um, these touchstones in the year, I find to be very soothing <laughs> and also to really strip back the ostentation of commercial capitalist consumption into really the things that we all have access to and do have value. Human connection, um, appreciating that time is sensitive, that time is ever moving on and things don't last forever. I think I've become in that way, a far more in touch person with a core value system that I see here in Germany that is recognized and valued in a way that I don't see recognized and valued as much in the United States. Anyway, speaking of the Banana Republic of the United States, uh, yeah, I guess it's time to move away from nice little chit-chat, warm reflections on, on life and, and beautiful things. Now that we had a, a little bit of time to center ourselves, let's move into the, uh, the BS zone. 
<laughs> sadly. But that's that's really what politics. I mean, one could always say it's been a BS zone, but we all recognize, I think, that uh, the Trump administration is unlike anything else we've seen. You know, guys, I'm I'm really not kidding when I talk about the banana republic of America. It's it's a pretty sad situation right now that we find ourselves in. We have basically a, a president who doesn't understand his job. He's not acting like the president of the United States. He's acting like the president of Trump Inc. And he's just applying everything he used to do in business or the kinds of things he could get away with in business to the White House. This, I think, is a mess. It exposes uh, the problem with hiring business people to run government. Business and government are actually adversaries, or they should be, because both are power centers. And and we need government to check the corrupting power of capitalism. And yet what we end up having when we hire businessmen, because they're so smart and they know how to make the best deals, they know how to run the government, what we end up getting is taxpayer money, taxpayer wealth, transferred into the private pockets of people who are in business. I'm sure many of you will be saying, yes, this isn't a surprise. I agree. I mean, there's a fundamental problem with the way that elections are funded in the United States. There's a problem with the influence of capitalism. And of course, corporate forces have every interest in trying to keep governments weak and distracted and to press in all the time for deregulation. But this whole Trump thing is taking it to an entirely new ne- new level of conflicts of interest, of out right attempts to, you know, enrich themselves by using their own real estate properties and housing government things like the, you know, the the Secret Service or hosting things at Mar-a-Lago in order to be able to offset a lot of these basically personal decisions and, and private comforts, billing it to the taxpayers, whether it's plane rides or, you know, golf trips. And the use of Trump hotels, you know, to promote, you know, the, the housing of Trump hotels and um, the getting of brand patents in China by Trump people after visits. It's just, and that's, that's just the one side of it. That's just the one part of it. Then there's the other entire section of it, which has to do with the way that Trump is destroying the, the role of the executive. The way that, for instance, he, you know, uh, I, I thought that perhaps he would release the Democratic memo, but w- heavily redacted. And now he's not even going to release it. He's just going to try to kick it into the long grass. This is the Democratic memo that is attempting, to, that would like to be published, or the Democrats would like to publish, to refute the Republican BS story that came out of Nunes's, um deluded head, because that's where, or his butt, uh, that seems to be where he gets most of his ideas, either when he's not wearing his tinfoil hat or he's, you know, scratching his ass and he comes across a nugget. And that's a sustained partisanship, putting partisanship above country, putting, protecting, a CYA, you know, cover your ass. That is what he's using the power of government to do, is to protect himself, protect his family, to get away with things, to enable his friends to get away with things. And I don't understand, it's, I don't think people quite realize yet. Um, you, you'd use this in combination with a Republican Party that is completely complicit with this, that won't check this president in any meaningful way, that is really just looking to keep its head down and pass all the bills, the Christmas list of things they've always wanted to do to America, selling their soul to the devil, basically, in exchange for Uh, tax cuts for the rich. Not even tax reform, just tax cuts for the rich. The country is in like a stage three terminal threat here. It's not open fascism yet, right? Uh, We don't have, well, we did have Nazis marching in the streets, but we don't have like a specific concerted cult of personality the way that we would, that people expect, I think, 
to happen when you say someone's a Nazi, you know, like uh, with, you know, oh, Hitler, you know, at his height. Hitler wasn't always at his height. Fascism is flexible in terms of the forms it's, it takes. Its goals are always the same. And that is authoritarian power concentrated in the hands of a few and the power of the state to basically enforce uh, this, you know, elite's view of authoritarianism on the country. I, I, we are, our democracy is in danger. And I don't want to, I mean, I, there is a fear of sounding like, you know, the end is nigh and you can sort of like, you know, people on the corner who talk really loud all day and people just walk past them going, I'm not, I don't, clearly I don't have time for that. But when it is the case that we had evidence come out this week that Russians did infiltrate certain state election computers, we had ongoing the probe that's exposing Russian ties. We found out that, you know, uh, that the government, the FBI, did not release the information about the Trump investigation, the ongoing Trump investigation during the campaign when people could have made decisions about it. I just look around at Congress, at the White House, at the civil servants, and I see failure. And I see failure due to partisanship everywhere. And that is how our democracy will die. It won't die from someone from the outside, you know, making an attack. And it, it won't die because of, you know, like a, a communist, even like if we had a, a social progressive sort of social democratic government in place, that wouldn't actually threat our be a threat to our institutions. What's a threat to our institutions is when people put partisanship above the country. And we're seeing that all the time. We saw it in Pennsylvania, where the Republicans were ordered to redraw a map before the next election because it was so um, palpably biased in favor of Republicans that the, su the Supreme Court ruled it to be unconstitutional. We've seen it in Wisconsin, where they had partisanship lines. It, this, this, this poison, this taint, this I hate to use the word cancer, that we're seeing metastasize. And I think the face of it is Trump. But this cancer has been building for a long time. People have been asleep. Americans have not actually valued their democracy. Americans are really good at standing up and singing the national anthem. They're really good at standing up and reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. They're really good at, some people especially, at standing up and, and lauding soldiers. But when it comes to the hard work, not the easy nationalist patriotism of we're the best country in the world, that's lazy patriotism. That's nothing patriotism. That's like, what's the word I'm looking for? It's like phoning it in. You know, it's the, it's the sleazy, it's like the McDonald's form of patriotism. You know what's harder? Keeping up on top of issues. Knowing who your town, town officials are on your town board, or who is your local county board supervisor. Who is your state representative? Who is your state senator? Who is your member of Congress? What issues are going through? That's where it gets hard. It's easy to stand up and salute a flag. That's utterly meaningless if you don't vote. Talking about the importance of the military is nothing if you aren't on top of your Congress reps asking, what are you doing about the mental health issues that soldiers face when they return? What are you doing to fund um, recovery programs for PTSD and house homeless veterans. That's the hard work. That's the hard work. Holding your representatives accountable, knowing what's happening in your government, caring what's happening in your government, and being able to transcend your personal preferences and your party loyalties to know what is best for the United States. Like, it, it, as for everybody, right? Because the way that I see it, right, we have Republicans doing this crazy partisan thing where they are putting their own personal, like, political preferences above everything else. Uber alles. Nothing else matters except tax cuts and entitlement reform and spending on the military and cut gutting things like, you know, the child health insurance program. You know, keep babies alive till they're born and then screw them over, you know, just let them suffer. I 
Okay, so I should, you know, I am a pragmatist. I am very American in this. I am a pragmatist when it comes to political outcomes. And I saw Dan Errol make, uh, write a tweet. It wasn't like he directed it at me, but it is a criticism that I'm sure he would say and others would say are entirely valid, that I will tweet out Joe Scarborough when I agree with him when he's criticizing Trump. I will tweet out Bill Kristol. I will tweet out Jennifer Rubin. Do I agree with these people on 100% of issues? No, I will happily criticize somebody that I think is a dirtbag on issue X. Like, okay, I won't, okay, I won't tweet out Hugh Hewitt because I personally have a beef with, against him because he dogpiled me like early on. He's an asshole. And so I won't ever tweet it. He could say two plus two equals four. And I fucking hate that guy for personal reasons. <laughs> this is a, a, a petty personal vendetta that I have against Hugh Hewitt. Um, and that's why I, I sort of like criticize him and his fake lip color every single time I see him. But here's the thing. When it comes to our political future and where we go, where we take our democracy in the 21st century as Americans. For me, the first point that's necessary is that we agree on the rules of the game. We have to first protect the institutions, protect the traditions, protect the integrity, the democratic legitimacy of our political institutions. And we do that by letting, by recreating faith that, okay, if one party gets in for a while, they'll make their decisions, but you know what? I have an equal and fair chance of getting into power on the next election, and then I can do my policies, right? If you, the first thing that we need in our government for people to have any kind of faith in it, and I know there's a lot of criticism about campaign financing and all that, but we actually, that's, that's a second order pro thing, right? The first thing is, if you fundamentally think that the game is rigged, so that Democrats will never win in your state again. That's when people check out. That's when dem democracy is just a sham for one party authoritarian rule. And so when I see people like Joe Scarborough and David Frum and Steve Schmidt and Jennifer Rubin and Nicole Wallace and Michael Steele, former RNC head, whoever else it might be, call out this president for unconstitutional behavior, call out this president for impeachable behavior, call out this president for behavior that violates the integrity of the office because he's using it for selfish reasons, not in the national interest. That to me is like in, in when you come across somebody in an emergency situation, right? First, you're supposed to make sure their, their heart's like beating then that they're breathing and then stop any of the bleeding. I think that's correct. If I'm wrong, you people in the chat will tell me. But it's the same kind of thing. If, if our institutions are fundamentally corrupted, there's nothing else we can do. And we've seen this corruption building with the Republican. It's a Republican agenda to destroy our democracy. It's not an outrageous thing to say when you look at how they've been behavior, behaving and what the courts have said about their behavior. The courts have found again and again that... Republicans are drawing congressional lines, they're gerrymandering not only congressional lines, but state office lines, to such an extent that it is unconstitutional, that people are denied fair representation. And this is the core cancer. The Republican Party and the people who stand with it, they're a threat to America. They are a threat to our institutions. And it sounds over the top to say it, but we, it's not. You can judge them on their behavior. You can judge them by the way they've abused congressional investigation committees. You can judge them based on the way that they have abused, um, you know, the, their ability to draw lines with gerrymandering. You can look at voter suppression and all the ways that they identify Democratic voters and they target them for specific obstacles to make it more difficult for them to get to the polls. The Republican Party is an attack on our democracy. They are not patriots. They are selfish traitors. And it's Mitch McConnell, and it's Paul Ryan, and it's Donald Trump, and it's anybody who stands with them. And it's anyone who voted for them, anyone who defends them, and anyone who works on perpetuating that power structure into the next election. They're anti-democratic traitors. They are putting, this isn't just about, you know, partisanship anymore. This is why I respect and stand with Republicans who are advocating for their fellow Republicans 
to vote for the Democratic Party because they recognize the Democrats are the last, last best hope to preserve our democratic institutions. Can you imagine being at that point, being a lifelong member of a party, being disgusted by the person who had taken over the party, and then be even sort of more woke as to the fact that, you know what, I might not be racist and my Republican friends in my circle might not be racist, but you know, all this democratic critique about the racism inherent in the Republican party, yeah, I see that now. I see how these people are using, you know, the Republican Party, the party of Reagan, to not promote democracy, but to undermine it. And to then walk away from their own party and become independents. And then not even just become satisfied with saying, hey, you know, I'm an independent and I'm going to vote for the person, not the party, whatever. But to then go 180 degrees from where you were maybe two years ago and say, you need to vote against my party because they are a danger to, the, to our republic. My former party is a danger to our republic. And that's what Republicans, some very sensible and patriotic Americans, are saying about their former parties or their parties that they're trying to reform from the inside. And I know that Dan Errol and some other people would say, it doesn't matter what Bill Crystal says. It doesn't matter what David Frum says. It doesn't matter what Joe Scarborough says. They're all scumbags. Well, you know what? If I look at it, in my opinion, if I look at it that way, I'm slapping away at the hands of allies who I actually, that I care about preserving our republic. I really do. I care about preserving our democratic institutions. The idea that I should still be angry with and piss on people who are allied with me and who have the same political goals, who are actually willing to advocate for people to vote for my candidates against their own former party because they are so worried about the Constitution. Sorry, it's like that emergency patient. The first problem we need to fix is getting Donald Trump and the Republicans out of power in the U.S. Congress, in state houses, everywhere possible push them out in legitimate ways while we still can and begin the process of reform. Begin the process of what Bob LaFalla, the great Bob LaFalla fighting Bob of Wisconsin back in the 1920s was a part of the progressive movement. You know, it's like, uh, this is not, sorry, 1920s, 18? Uh, I have to go, no, no, I think it was the 1920s. Sorry, <laughs> I'm getting my centuries mixed up. But this progressive movement was about fixing the corruption in government and putting more sunlight onto what people were doing behind the scenes, making it more transparent, letting people see what was happening inside that government. And I have that fighting Bob's, you know, La Follette spirit inside me as a Wisconsinite, as an American. I see that we can do better. I see we can have an accountable government. But the first step is the, the critical issue, which is democratic legitimacy. And that democratic legitimacy comes from, yes, in part campaign finance reform, you're right. I totally agree. Like, it's a huge issue. But before we can deal with campaign finance reform, we need to get Democrats elected. Democrats are already running a, on a tilted table. And so I am not going to slap away the hands of people who are telling their supporters to vote for my candidates because we both recognize the existential threat Republicans pose to our republic. Again, I, I kind of worry that I, I'm, I'm the woman screaming on the corner with the sign, the end is nigh. But I do feel like this is, you know, stage three out of stage four. Like we are approaching times where we will, demo, we will injure, we will damage our institutions irreparably. And it doesn't take that much. We've learned in the course of the last two years, you can learn more by watching how Putin operates in other parts of the world. It's not that difficult to destroy democracy. It really isn't. It's a very fragile thing. You just need to set people in a population against each other, destroy trust between citizens, you need to get people to see their fellow citizens as threats and enemies. I know it's certainly working in my part because I see the threat to our democracy and I will name it the Republicans, hashtag not all the Republicans, but too many Republicans. And you have a situation where um, you know, you destabilize by giving one group power and you set that group against another group and 
use bots to promote disinformation, to promote, you know, uh, just extreme views and, and very antagonistic content into the population where people are having these discussions all the time, it doesn't take very much. And then, like I said, you combine it with gerrymandering, voter suppression, unconstitutional practices found again and again and again. It's a sustained attack on our democracy. So what are you doing? Of course, if you're not an American, uh, then all of this is a little bit academic. You can just sit from the sidelines, but maybe you know an American uh, or a few Americans. Please ask them what they're doing. <laughs> what are you doing to stop the destruction of democracy right before our eyes? And I think we can, we still have time. We have, uh, even though we've got Scott Walker in, in Wisconsin trying to basically not hold elections because he's afraid of the outcomes, you can't do that forever. Well, at least they can't do it yet. And so we've got elections coming up. We've seen good turnout, but it's not enough for the usual people to turn out. And I, I want to see those people who claim to be patriots really put the Constitution and the institutions ahead of their political preferences. And to be honest, when you see evangelical leaders giving Trump a pass on having an affair um, after his marriage, being involved with someone in the adult film industry. We also see the pattern that Trump surrounds himself with men who assault women, beat women, uh, sexually abuse women. He himself admitted to sexual assault. I, I think people on the right often use this idea of, you know, sort of decadence. Like, I, I guess I always can sort of associate it with like a gay pride parade. You know, like that's that's like the sort of modern decadence that's going to bring down society. People in uh, people in in lipstick and and hot pants. You know what? That is not to me any serious moral corruption that we need to worry about. You know what? A, a deeper corruption is a far deeper corruption is uh, when you have men who hit women being enabled by other men who tolerate sexual abuse or demeaning women. That, that is the kind of corruption that I worry about. That is, it's not even decadence. It's a core corruption. It's a rot. It's a moral turpitude. That's a fancy word for you. Um, that, that is what strikes me as being far more dangerous to our society than, you know, decadence in the sort of way of people living their lives for you. Before we wrap up and get into the interview that I did with, uh, with Natalie Alford last night, I wanted to make a recommendation. I do talk about this in the interview, but if you have a subscription to Netflix and you have time, uh, or you're looking for something to watch, I would highly, 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 highly recommend you watch a series called The Keepers. On Netflix, it. Uh, I'll get out my phone here and see if I can pull it up. It is. A, you need a strong content warning, though. It discusses the sexual abuse of children at Catholic institutions, in particular one Catholic uh, high school in Baltimore. It's very. It's very difficult to watch. It's very difficult to listen to, and I'm not going to lie. However. It's important, I think, that people watch it. And it's important that people witness, be witnesses to the truths uh, that come out of this documentary. So yes, it's called The Keepers on Netflix. It's from 2017. And the summary reads, this docuseries examines the decades-old murder of Sister Catherine Sesnick and its suspected link to, the pre to a priest accused of abuse. I really don't want to say any more than that because the story that unfolds, if it was in a movie, you wouldn't believe it. If it was in a movie, you would say, 
that's far too ridiculous to ever be uh, something that would really happen in real life. But the evidence presented in the docuseries is amazingly compelling, especially as time goes on. And I think I, I need to understand more about Hannah Arendt's concepts of the banality of evil. That, you know, uh, we tend to think of evil as, you know, the, the stereotype in, in culture is an active force, an act of malevolence, a, a sort of, you know, evil supernatural power. And I think there is far more evil done in the name of people covering their butts and covering up for their institutions and not wanting to face consequences that ends up creating and perpetuating far more pain and suffering to others than they will experience. So it's it's about rape culture, really. Ultimately, The Keepers is it's about a murder, but it is also about the Catholic Church and its rape culture and the kinds of information that was exposed about the Catholic Church in this um, in this docu series had me shaking in anger, had me physically sick, um, feeling nauseous because of what they allowed to happen, what what they helped to create in terms of human suffering and the destruction of lives. And the only thing I can really do because you know, these are events that happened in 1969, in the early 1960s. Hey, there's my phone uh, going off. Is to be a witness, to know that it happened, to acknowledge the crimes that were committed and that the crimes for which the Catholic Church has never been held accountable, not legally, not financially, and to encourage other people is to spread the news, spread the information, uh, lift it up as an example of rape culture and of patriarchy. For me, the kind of corruption that I see in the Trump White House with women basically being viewed as worthy of three things, being effed, being beaten, and then hiding behind their skirts to cover up for being effed and being beaten. Those are the three roles for women in that White House. Um, you know, I see a lot of similarities in the Catholic Church and how it handled this particular situation. And I, I know with Spotlight, so many other cases of abuse have come up and been exposed and put into the light. But, um, uh, you know, Spotlight focused far more on the people who were doing the reporting, the people who were doing the investigating. And this docuseries focuses on the people who were destroyed. And in this case, it was primarily um, young girls, 14, 15, 16 at the time, 17. But also um, there were some uh, male victims that are brought up as well. I think it's important to be a witness to that, to acknowledge and remember and tell others because that is pretty much the, the best way to internalize, for me, uh, a lived experience of that pain since I don't have it directly. That's, you know, I've never, I didn't experience child abuse. And so I can't relate to victims on that level, but watching this documentary really blew me away in terms of, um, I just wanted to hug every single person I saw on screen. It's not, a, it's not an easy watch, as I said, but it is an important thing to be a witness to. And so I strongly recommend The Keepers on Netflix. Now we're going to be switching over to my interview with Natalie Alford. We are discussing mostly issues around like feminism, the Me Too movement, issues of sexual harassment and abuse in politics, in power, and in the private lives of, of public people. And here is my interview with Natalie Alford. First off, hi! Oh, it's so good to talk to you. <laughs> yes, it's really good to hear your voice again. I mean, I see your uh, tweets, and I definitely get your attitude in your tweets, but your voice carries it so much you more know, realistically, you know? You get you get the chutzpah in it with the voice, <laughs> yeah. you know? Oh, what you would call it. No, it's uh, funny because uh, what you would call it, 
I don't know. We have such different voices, but we jive. I don't, <laughs> a lot of my friends are very, uh, what you would call it. They, they point out, we know that you were trained in opera, but so <laughs> um, how are you doing? Yeah, uh, we've got carnival going on here in Cologne. So I was out and uh, taking part. We started, well, what was the motto I, I picked up on TV? You can't drink all day long if you don't start in the morning. Exactly. And it, it takes work. It really <laughs> yeah, does. Yeah. I just say, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm, I was definitely, my prime is four hours because when I was at university, and I mm. turned 21, you could, uh, we would go up for 10 and the bars would close at two. So I tend yeah. to like, and I did that for just years. So if you get me into like six hours of drinking and seven hours of drink, I just, I can't, I, I don't have the stamina. I'm not a marathon drinker. For me, what you would call it, I, I don't do it anymore, but when I, what you would call it, there's this brunch that we do, um, a, a bunch of artists get together and we do a, a brunch all day. And last time, uh, because food is everywhere, so when you're able to eat and just like stay and drink, anyway, it was a bad day the next day. I have, I'm like, oh my God, how did I used to do this? I can't do this anymore <laughs> to my body. It's it's falling apart. Uh, but what you call it, speaking of, so, so we want to talk about, um, what do you want to talk about, like sexual harassment, but like other stuff? Too. What do you want to talk about? I want your take on me too, and because you, I've seen over the course of several Ooh. months, you know, you talked yeah. about your experience as a waitress versus as a um, a live model for art uh -huh. courses, and um, the issues women of color face, and just all the kind of stuff. And I thought this, you know, this shouldn't just be in Twitter bursts. I would rather mm -hmm. have you just start talking and let you go. Ooh, just like go off. Yeah, Ooh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Like whatever. Like do you, when the when the topic comes up, you know. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, way to call it. Well, well, first should we it? should acknowledge that this was actually started by a black woman. Me too. Toronto Burke. Yeah. Right? Way before it became trendy or a big thing. Um, yeah. And so this is not like a recent thing. This is just a recent thing. Like you know, white people have started. Well, you know, my, white media have, have well, been even paying just attention to. Yeah. yeah. Even even just in the mainstream and in the like. Um, the nadir of our discussion, because I'm not gonna lie, I didn't know about Toronto Burke. I didn't know about, um, I didn't know about it until, like we said, when it all started happening. When I I like to call it when the bricks started falling off the building, because I remember when the Me Too thing that weekend happened, and it was just everybody, all of us were like telling our stories on Facebook, on Twitter, and all of our you know most cis het guys were completely shocked. Right. And um, like I said, I, I really am glad that Toronto Burke has finally gotten the props that she deserves. But I don't want to necessarily dismiss that now we have it at least in the popular lexicon, because at, at least we do. You know, I think that this is going to happen like in ebbs and flows um, personally for me with that. that. That's just my aside with that, you know. Yeah, I'll take, I mean, I certainly, uh, I also was completely ignorant of Me Too, but yeah. uh, what what changed was not the activism, what changed, as you say, was the consciousness, and I do, I do think that it really helped uh, the movement, too, there are two things, it was, I, it was, it was the women's movement and the women's marches and that whole mm -hmm. not just the marches themselves but the energy behind the marches and the energy that's been keeping people uh, going for the last year that turned out again this year's march that um sort of network and the collective uh, sort of feeling that there are other people out there that are like-minded i think when the whole harvey weinstein thing blew up mm -hmm. too um, you know, there was, the, you know, the whole um, people coming forward, people talking about their experiences, as you say, mainstreaming this. And it really has changed the dynamic. So now that we when we do get allegations, like, you know, when John Kelly says that the guy who had two former wives uh, tell the FBI that he physically and emotionally abused them, John Kelly was like, eh. Yeah, no, I, uh, what you call it. Well, it's no surprise. One of the first things that this administration did was cut funding uh, for federal funding for uh, domestic abuse and survivor programs for 93%. Now it's over 10 years, but 93%. And who who does the these programs affect mostly? It is women. I like I said we're not dismissing uh, we all victims. Yeah. Exactly, but these yeah, yeah but the, if you have an administration, the first thing they do that 
that's what really made me angry with the John Keller's the adult in the room. Absolutely yeah. not. Yeah. These and the other thing, too, that I wonder about is I think when um, Donald Trump was elected and like this whole thing with me, too, and I feel like women's like head snapped or there was like literally a snap in a, a lot of women's head because this man admitted to sexually assaulting women repeatedly, not not just once, not just this one person. It was repeated sexual assault. And this person was elected regardless. I don't, and that's like the screwed up thing that I have with this is that I wonder if because it was so, like the audacious administration that is put in here, is this like part of that reaction? Is this part of that like, I, I find it fascinating and I, yeah. I do like, I'm really glad it's happening, but at the same time right now, you know, women are suffering as this goes on be because of this and at the same time the consciousness is raised and then at the same time people are mad like after three months which by the way don't don't you love it that for like hundreds and hundreds of years we have <laughs> to put up with it and then three months into yeah. finally like okay can you can you stop showing us your dick and yeah. <laughs> then it's like you know what okay so i can't talk to women now Men to dirt. like oh my god but I don't know what your thoughts on that. No, like, I, I think you're onto something. I think there's a bit of displaced frustration in that yeah. people who felt aggrieved by evangelical Christians and evangelical white women going over and voting for this guy and putting him in office and um, that affront, as you say, to uh, people, men and women, who looked at him and went, he is a sexual predator. He's an, he emitted assault. You know, even Rudy Giuliani said what he described would be under the statutes sexual assault so it's not a question of if he did it he we know he did it but when you can't get him because he's in the white house for four years and some other dirt bag comes up and he is you know and has done dirt bag things and and as you said you know with weinstein it was like 35 women louis ck you know it, this isn't just like a one-on-one -on -one thing this is you know these guys are serial offenders and so there are a lot of victims and changing that whole right before trump these kinds of things would just get news stories and then get glossed over. And something has fundamentally changed where um, a, enough people have said, we're not going to tolerate, we are changing what we consider acceptable behavior. And even with, again, this Rob Porter thing, uh -huh. the um, charges against him, you know, made him um, open to blackmail. Yeah. You know, this and so this had national security implications and and just you know on its yeah the guy did not and yet they made sorry and, and so the guy did not do the clearance and yet they made room for him this is rape culture this is how perpetrators <laughs> continue to perpetrate because they're enabled by stronger people and institutions that protect them and this is the kind of shit that that you know we that people are calling out and i every time um in the newspaper i see another headline of women who've come forward or men but you normally it's women coming forward and accusing a guy and him ending up stepping down, whether it's that win guy or there was somebody else recently this week. I'm like, good for you. Good for you. Mm -hmm. You are having an effect and you're driving the problem out of the industry because, you know, it is the power structures around these guys. And except for like one woman I've seen now accused of a male staffer, it's been exclusively men. No. Uh, these are power structures bound up with, you know, male power and male privilege. And um, this, yeah, it feels very passe now to just um, dismiss one of these accusations, to not even say, like, uh, Orrin Hatch came out immediately and said, I know this guy, he's a good guy. These women are, you know, smearing him. Yeah. And then had to eat, step back and take the, you know, he didn't do enough to apologize to the people he, you know, he, he slurred Slandered. for telling the truth yeah. to the FBI, right? They were doing their national duty. It was Trump. Who is violating our national security there by having that guy or john kelly or both of them because the president mm -hmm. i'm sure didn't know and if he shouldn't didn't know then the chief of staff should be fired for not telling him you know so there's no win situation here but yeah we're not going back to those days where orrin hatch can just come out and lead to a guy's defense and say hey i know him and he's a good guy well you know what you're not his wife you yeah, don't you're know not, him like that so unless he, unless he's him. the godfather of your children uh, well even then even yeah. then because it's not an excuse because one of the things um i forgot which member of the Beastie Boys it was, um, but his father was a, a big director in the theater world in New York. And 
accusations came out against him. And guess what his son said? His son was like, you know what? I believe the women and I stand with them. There are people who are in fact, that's an example of, you know what? Sometimes it's your family. Sometimes it's your friends. Like this is how deep it goes. Um, and like you said, personally with John Kelly and that, that, I think that they knew and I think that they did not care. Yeah, I think so too. I, because um, one of the things is, and this goes on um, a different, Thing, but my mom worked at a Keys to Recovery. Uh, it was a rehabilitation center and it was at a hospital. And in the downstairs area, you have no idea. My, my mom, sometimes her heart would break because there would be this woman who was being abused by her police officer husband. And it was a routine of she would come in, she would get fixed, and she was literally like escorted out by his co workers back to her house. Like, this is the culture that we are fighting. Right. That's part of the reason why I don't, like I said, I think all those guys knew and that they didn't care. It's like, mm -hmm. whatever, he's our buddy, he's in the club. Because this is the thing too, is people don't understand how powerful, I call it the club, but I, like the club is that perfect rich, I, I call it like the rich white guy, like, or like the, the, the fraternity of it where they will cape for each other, the whole bros before hoes, like, yeah. um, but also that elite thing of, this is the bigger thing is they think people who aren't them are disposable. Yeah. And that is, I think the bigger thing that, you know, I want the Me Too movement to go towards because one of the things like you know what like the larry nasser thing obviously we have to talk about that oh my god but the larry nasser thing with even some of the best athletes in the world they are winning medals and they were getting molested the entire time the entire time and completely unbelieved and also larry nasser which when i found out the detail that he was on the rules committee that set up uh the rules and patterns of procedure on how to report <sighs> harassment from staff <sighs> so we look at, so think about that yeah. is this is what we have to think non-disclosure agreements ndas the amount that it's used to keep people from reporting sexual harassment or talking about the sexual assault or harassment um putting people in positions of power to dictate the rules on these things we know that hr if you have hr by the way um they aren't there for the people who are reporting incidents they are there for the company yeah more often than not we know it's like we we did the investigation of ourselves and we did nothing wrong um yeah. but uh for me that's one of the things that gets me about you know, if you want to talk about historically, like that whole thing with like being disposable, have you ever heard of the castratas or castrados? The the young boys who were castrated so that their voices would remain high so they could sing in the choirs at a yes. soprano level for their whole lives? Yes. So the things that were first off done to these boys, they were kidnapped essentially from their families. Um, they liked targeting poorer boys for this because uh, you know they were if you were a castrato you were taken care of that you got the most money so much money so much fame and they would basically give this situation to the families of the boys of like listen you can have money or you cannot and these were church these are monks that were stealing children the, the catholic church like we said but there's this precedent of basically treating you know the stars but the, the people behind the scenes abusing and it's it, it's horrible abuse um you know it the whole thing that's re reminded me of like you know with the gymnasts but like the way that like i said that club of everybody's disposable and everybody's for my delight like donald trump like exemplifies that but there are people predators like that who think Every everybody is for my disposal. I am the most important, and that's the big root of the patriarchy. That and yeah, I use the p word. Uh, <laughs> I try to avoid it on Twitter just to not get dogpiled. But uh, but um, that's that's the key thing of it. I 
and it, it astonishes me that people don't understand like that's the predator mo you're disposable they don't care about you yeah absolutely i mean going with this the nasser story this is the doctor um mm -hmm. who was abusing uh, the gymnasts in his care Three. and yes and you know one of the girls went to the police Mm -hmm. and reported it and you know and, and then the institutions start to come down and protect their reputation and protect themselves and not the victims and this is this is a part of rape culture i know everyone again there's another word right Ooh, patriarchy and rape culture no, for, me, don't I, say it. for me rape culture isn't a descriptor it's like a sociological process it's mm -hmm. it's the conspiracy of silence of covering up as you say of marginalizing victims I just finished watching on Netflix a docu-series called The Keepers, which was all about um, the, I hate to use the cancer, but the, the cancer inside the Catholic Church that was about covering up and protecting abusive priests. And this, it's a seven part series. And as it unfolds, the way the Catholic Church is complicit, it basically had a rape culture. It would move sexual predators from institution to institution. And they left oh, yeah. a wake of children who were destroyed in their wake. And it's it's like watching it, it it's, it's phenomenal. I would highly recommend everybody watch it. If you have Netflix, The Keepers, go and check it out. However, content warning, the sexual abuse that's described is horrific. It is. I actually, I know what you're talking about. And I was able to make it through like two episodes, I had to come back to it too. Because, yeah, of, yeah. well, like you said, not only the abuse, but just how really hardcore they were about defending such like horrors yeah real horror i like uh, and it, it's astonishing to me that people still have a problem with accepting like look this this is not new stuff like this is back to the roman times of you know the way that they protected power and the way that they yeah. used people um you know, if only Boa to see a one that got that goddamn battle in Britain, you know. If yes. <laughs> she could have the, the, yes, the Roman and yeah, invaders and oh, Britain for the British. Uh, she was the first Brexiteer. <laughs> yeah, she was the first Brexiteer when it was actually could have been good. And then we could have like gotten the, those Romans out with their patriarchal crap. But um, no, I, I think it's just like astounding to me that the reactions like i said of we we've, we've known about the catholic church we've known about you know with great power and like you know screwed up attitudes oh yeah people get abused but the fact right now can we talk about like um why do you think men are so confused let's say confused with like oh no so i can't talk to anybody why do you think that is like just from your and also like your favorite hot take? Yeah, I think that, you know, definitely since I've been growing up. So, you know, at least my generation back, we are presented in the media with this image of men that cat call women that can say anything to women. Women are basically, as you said, seen as disposable objects that you're meant to put your penis in. Yeah. And it's it's hard, I think, for um, men or boys who are raised with that image, who also have the th idea that pe women are people, too. Or, you know, so people can probably be on a kind of a spectrum or change their minds at different points in their lives. But this sense of entitlement to talk to women uh, in a certain way and not have to watch what they say and to not watch their have to watch their body language and to not have to make sure they don't give off the wrong signal to somebody is new to them because they've never been a woman because <laughs> that's what we do all the time Dude. we're constantly monitoring ourselves around men so that we don't give the wrong impression and oh they've my. never had to do it to, around us you know and i'm just going with this heteronormative thing here because it's you know a lot of the conversation but in terms of that part of it i think that's that's a big part of it they're just not used to having to actually moderate or monitor their own behavior around women in that way. I I think, yeah, th there's on that, like, to go off on that, I remember on Facebook, when the whole, like I said, the bricks were falling down with everybody saying, uh, me too, me too. And what I noticed was, when, you know, let's say that there was a woman or somebody um, telling their story, they decided to tell their story. But then you'd see in the common threads, all these dudes asking for every weird awful detail that you could tell that you could tell was like 
you know, people were asking, like, can you not ask me about these details? This is really hard for me. Like, even after you admit it, they're so used to wait. But then, like, what were you saying? Like, where were you? How were you, like, going? I'm not sure about that. Like, they're not only, like, not used to, like, not hearing no for an answer, but then even if they're engaging in that predatory behavior, they assume that they are entitled to every answer of the question. You know what I'm saying? Like, all the oh, people yeah. that get... Yeah, all the people that get mad at Steve Shives for blocking, <laughs> they are mad because they feel entitled to a response. Nobody owes you res nobody owes you a time of day, but there are, and this tends to be a cis heteronormative problem of no, you owe me, uh, you owe me your time, your attention, and I, you know, I want to bully you, I want to harass you. That's that's my right. You have to meet my level of reasonable <gasps> doubt. To beat me! Like, yeah, I, oh, oh God. <laughs> but that, like, spills over into that. And I, I, like I said, I was, like, getting, like, guys, you really don't know how to talk about any of this. And I remember, like, even just the simple things that I told about waitressing. Um, because... Yes, please talk about that. Oh, God. <laughs> well... So one of the things that I want the Me Too movement to explore, and I'm glad that uh, Time's Up has had their issues, but I, I'm glad that they're going into trying to start a legal fund because one of the biggest things in the food service industry and specifically serving is there's a couple problems with the tip system and with the National Restaurant Association and their, oh, sorry, my... Uh, Beyonce's coughing. Uh, but so with the National Restaurant Association, their shenanigans, who, which by the way, used to be head by Herman, Herman Cain. So if we want to talk about examples, because he had his own, you know, sexual assault yep, issue allegations too. Exactly. So serving has the problem of, so we have that classist, lovely society, like I said, classism, patriarchy, it's just like evil, evil, evil. And people have a problem just in general with the way they look at food service. They think that people in food service uh, are taking a lazy job or, you know, they like to look down on them. I, I remember very much feeling like sometimes there was just this like air of they, I don't know, they don't want to deal with you. But regardless of that, you have a mainly female workforce in the food service industry. And it just so happens it's the most underpaid uh, food, underpaid industry. Mm -hmm. And not only that, it has the highest levels of complaint on sexual harassment. You can look it up. There was an amazing study done and it showed that basically 90% of food service uh, employees and uh, servers and restaurants experience sexual harassment weekly. Weekly. Not in it, their not careers. Not mm -hmm. in their careers, weekly. And I saw that and pretty much everybody in the service said, oh yeah, no, that makes sense. Because if you have tipping, and this is part of the reason I wanna talk about tipping, because every, almost everywhere else in the world, food service people uh, or, or waiters, they make a certain amount right. of a money per hour. hour. More, enough to, you know, like it's-, it's a, Livable, it's, yeah. it's livable. So- In most places, in Europe. Yeah, it, in most places, but the National Restaurant Association has lobbied tooth and nail to keep us on a tipping system. Now, why would the National Restaurant Association try really hard to keep people on tipping? It's not because wait servers are just so static about how great the tips are because yeah, sometimes you have a good night, but guess what? You show up on a dead day, guess who's not making any money that day? And the also the other thing is if they had to pay their employees a livable wage, they would actually need to bill that in the food. Exactly. So well, here, no, that's... tipping is a way to get other people to pay for your employees' work. Really. Exactly. Because not only that too, the, like the, I, I'm sure maybe that they have to put a bill on it, but you know what? It is actually worth the cost because it's not as big as people would even think it. Because how? Why in the world are, is a lot of other countries doing this with service? So you're based off a tipping system, right? You're reliant on people's money. And the amount of times you're in that situation where you go up to a table and then you're already getting sexual harassment, you're you're waiting for maybe another 40 to 60 people, right? And each 
table is money. Okay. So what am I going to do? Am I going to be like, you know what, sir, uh, I'm going to only see these people for the next 30 minutes and you're so trying to get busy and quick and you, you need that tip. And you know that if you get the manager there, you're going to lose another three tables to take care of the situation. Or also the manager would tell you it's not that big of a deal, which yes, that has happened. I was one time, uh, a customer grabbed my butt and I was shaken up about it. And I went to my manager and then he was like, Oh, do you want a cigarette break? Yeah, that was it. And not, end of, end not, of you never handle my employees. Get out of here. You're banned. Nothing like no, that. Absolutely not. Because the managers have the problem of seeing that's money. And that it is so ingrained in men to one. And also in like positions of power, bosses, it's so ingrained in them to tend to not listen to their employees. We've heard about this over and over again, where employers and managers, they take advantage of like employees and the food service is rife with this. So they tend to always protect these abusers. And the amount of times, I, by the way, the amount of times I've heard of like predators who would you know, be handsy with the women. And then later on in the night, they start a fight or they get too drunk or they throw glasses and then they get kicked out. It is infuriating, Christy. It is absolutely infuriating, but it goes like that so many times, which is part of the reason why it, it's amazing to me that people don't take um, sexual harassment and sexual assault as seriously as it should, because it's a very clear indicator of future violent behavior. How many times do we see with, uh, you know, mass shooters, mass shooters yeah. who have a history of domestic, domestic violence. violence. Yep. How many times over and over again? So this all plays out in this really weird microcosm of the service industry. So you're not only getting harassed by customers, sometimes you're getting harassed by management. So of course, management isn't going to care if you are getting sexually harassed when they're doing it themselves. And it's sick. And then your paycheck depends on it. And I can't, I can't tell you the amount of times, like I said, like you would just, I remember one time a manager told me, and this is like one of the most screwed up things I've ever heard was if you aren't crying once a week at your job, you're doing it wrong. What? If yeah. you aren't crying once a week at your job, you're doing it wrong. It has to do with the abuse of getting uh, overworked and then also dealing with uh, the customers and what the what basically what they'll do what they'll take out on you right and mm. it's i remember being terrified but also i was like you know what that actually kind of makes sense so for me i really hope me to looks into the bigger picture especially in food service of like look these are mainly female employees in this industry and most of the managers most if not all and all the owners are are men there like i said there are exceptions but this is a way bigger problem. Like I understand, like, you know, some people think, oh, it has to be big multimillionaire power. Uh, 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 uh. No. no, you can anyone you, with power. Anyone with power. There was like a big thing, um, the fight for 15 in Chicago. There uh recently they've been taking on uh, a couple Burger King franchises because uh it was found out like this manager was sexually assaulting female employees who were undocumented because this is another aspect of this too you have undocumented women who are not coming forward because, because they're afraid. exactly exactly and that's that's the problem of it and so i don't know if you have thoughts on that yeah, yeah i just want to make sure when you're when the, the statement if you're crying in your you once a week you're doing it wrong is that for the managers or is that for the employees or i, I don't the, know my maybe. manager told the employees this and how are they how are they doing it wrong? I don't I don't understand. You're not working hard enough. What? I, I just, remember I... that's literally what it is. It's like if you're not stressed out enough, if uh one of the things is is I think the discussion was on clopening. Have you ever heard the term clopin? No. no okay. No. It's a really regular term and it's when you are closing the restaurant or the store or whatever and then you have to come in the morning. And more than, and that's illegal because employee, because say, um, and this would happen all the time. I got uh, out of work at like 4 a.m., right? Because it's a bar. Right. And then they want me to come in at 11. 
So then I get home at five and then you get maybe five hours. That's illegal. Yeah. But it's done all the time. So not only are you overworked and tired, right? So he was like mentioning it of that of like, no, you have to take every shift that you can and you're going to be tired and you're going to take all the like emotional baggage that every customer is going to give you. Right. And that was what that statement meant for the tipping wage. Cause that's worth it. Like this, there, exactly. there you have to pay me a million dollars. I don't even know if a million dollars a year would be worth the emotional stress <laughs> of that bullshit. It. Let alone a minimum wage job where you rely on tips, mm -hmm. which means you're making basically what two ten an hour. You make you know, two ten. Money? The yeah. average server would make around. I've never made over twenty thousand dollars in my food service life, ever, ever. I've heard of waiters um, in in fine dining and fine dining. Okay. Right. Um, maybe making like around 40 or $50,000, but the average is pathetic. You know, I, I remember I worked at the Republican server, which yes, they are there, <laughs> but it was like, I get to be my own boss and I don't want uh, it to go away from tipping. I make this much. And it's like, yeah, but across the country, people aren't making that much. Like right. you're literally only thinking about yourself but that's another conversation. But yeah, no, there is no amount of, uh, for for that amount of money, like it, financial it was ridiculous. remuneration. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just psychologically that 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 stress. It's going to kill you. No job is worth killing yourself for. Oh yeah, and then uh, on top of that, getting sexually harassed and then being told, well, yeah. whatever. And yeah. knowing you can't sue, knowing you can't hire, there isn't any HR. Are you kidding? Like, there. Oh, know. no, no. There's, yeah, a lot of companies, small businesses don't even have HR. You just have the boss. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, and what do you do in that situation? Um, and that's one of the things that really gets me on this discussion because, um, I, like I said, I, I'm really glad that Time's Up at least brought that up of this is going to be for also for the women who can't afford yeah. a legal defense the most and I, people, yeah but i think it's a band-aid and i hope that we do look at um the because there are economic reasons and classes reasons of who gets targeted you know it i, I it's not to diminish anybody in um you know a high power situation because you know white collar jobs yeah yeah and it, it, it's not demeaning or diminishing anything like that but you know on top of the thing with like you know being on your feet i like some of the memories i have with that like they're pretty painful and i'm like how in the world like what i i would see people drop off their daughters to like apply for the restaurant and i wanted to tell these girls like get the hell away and there's like this weird mentality that people have of like, oh, it's just a food job. And, you know, it's just this or that. And everybody should do that. And like, you know, but I, I really wish that it wasn't like, because I can bring up the art model thing, too, because I was an art model at the same time, because we this beautiful excuse of like, oh, well, what about what they were wearing? Right. right. Yeah. I worked at a restaurant. <laughs> what were they wearing? Guess what? I, the restaurant job that I worked at, I had ketchup stained pants, those ugly orthopedic black shoes because they had to be on my feet all day, an mm -hmm. ugly loose fitting black t-shirt. Like it, it, it astounds me when people get that. When I was an art model, I would be in a classroom butt naked for three hours and I was never, ever ever sexually harassed you know why because the teacher in that room and the places that i did they did not tolerate that there was no tolerance for that and i knew one of the uh my uh artists that i loved modeling for she was like oh we we once time in an issue with the guy and uh, i kicked it i kicked his ass right out um because it's like that's this isn't what art class is for and most of them don't care so for me, I can't buy your excuse of it's what they were wearing. I, I, sorry, I've had a different experience in yes, a different work environment, but obviously there's 
obviously that there, there's something bigger to this. Definitely. And I think what you're seeing, your two examples here are, are wonderful juxtapositions. I'm glad you brought them up and talked about them because what it really shows is that the ethics start where the power is. Yes. And if the, you know, the instructor of that class was of the position, I want my class, everyone to feel comfortable in my class, whether they're naked or clothed and understanding that a person who's taking their clothes off is in a vulnerable position and they need to be made to feel safe and mm -hmm. respected and seen as more than, you know, a piece of ass, right? Um, yeah. and that is the norm that's led from the top and everybody else follows and those who don't get booted, right? Because well, it's, yeah, and it's funny too, like I just have to put it aside, like it's amazing to be looked at when you're naked, but literally it just be like, oh, I wonder like, a bit, like just having like, like you're a math problem. <laughs> and like it's like such a weird thing of like oh my god yeah they, they don't really care they're just trying to get the shadow right or like they're trying to get this or that right and that's like part of the reason I liked it and it, it was like in a way therapeutic because um I was like no I I'm not in I'm not crazy when I know that what's going on at my other job is really bad because there was that complete difference you know and mm -hmm. um i don't know like what else was it gonna say but yeah go on yeah oh yeah and then you know if you have a boss whether it's a man or a woman but as you point out a lot of management in the food service in service industries are, are men and they don't respect you know like they they might love their wives and their daughters and their mothers but they still see women a lot of women as objects and they see their employees as objects from their customers point of view even though they know him, they can kind of like, oh yeah, I can, you know, see where he's coming from and mm -hmm. it can empathize with that. Then you're not going to be in a workplace where your dignity as a human being is, is being um, made important to that workplace. I respect it. Yeah. So, because how can, how are uh, customers or any place supposed to respect an employee when they can tell that the management doesn't? Yeah. I mean, my mom and stepfather owned a business and, you know, there was a sort of the back of the shop bit, but even with the back of the shop, you'd have people come around to look at their bikes or explain what the repairs needed to be before they, you know, the work was done or whatever. And uh, when they um, had the business at some point, you know, my mom uh, went to the back of the store, back of the shop there, and they had a bunch of pinup girls um, up and she's like, nope, take those down. Because when women walk in here, I don't want them to look at that and think, you know, like, that's how you're looking at them. You yeah. can do that on your own time, but yeah. you're not going to display those images in my workplace because we have female customers and we have female employees and we all, yeah. you know, so, um, and I was like, damn, mom, I didn't know that about you, but you go, <laughs> you go, mom, you yeah. go, no, the things, oh God, my mom, the things that she had to deal with, cause she was also like a waitress. Um, and then while she was studying to be a psychologist, so she was working at a rehabilitation center then a suicide pre uh, hotline prevention mm -hmm. center. And then wow. sometimes she would still do waitressing like oh. after she had, no, she's, she's amazing. But um, what you call it? No, I completely agree with that. And I had a point that I wanted to make. Oh, um, do we want to talk about maybe uh, that daughter? Oh, I have daughters. It's, it's, it's the father of a, or as a, as a wife of, oh, what do you yes. think about that excuse every time something happens? <sighs> yeah, we know you right? have relationships with women, right? Um, <gasps> you know? Oh God, you know who? I, you know, as a daughter, Donald Trump. Okay, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. okay. doesn't matter. <laughs> it, yeah, yeah I, I I don't know why it is so confusing, or and I even get so frustrated when I see. Think about if that was your daughter or your whatever, because um, I read this article about. You know about a who's that guy from that somebody show who was accused recently? Oh yeah, I don't know his name, but I know I read about it. Danny something. Yeah. And it was like screwed up because uh, a story came out where like this woman who was one of the people who came forward against him was at a girls' soccer game, her daughter's soccer game, and then she ran into this dad who turned out to be one of the showrunners or like at Netflix or he was the one who like was on that team and this was in Huffington Post and she asked what do you think about this and he just straight up said oh I don't believe them I think that they're all making it up he had his daughter in that soccer game by the way so he told of 
woman who had, yeah. was coming forward. Oh, I don't believe it. I think she's making it up. And this woman was like, I hope that you, your daughter never feels how I feel right now. Because mm -hmm. that's the problem. People think mm -hmm. that fathers don't react like that. And they do. And daughters pick that up. Like, this is the thing is, you know, the whole thing, I have a daughter or whatever. It's like, cool, but your daughter's not going to tell you anything that happened to her. Like this whole thing with the way that trauma works, if something traumatic happens, sometimes they feel uh, either the guilt of they don't want their parent to get in trouble, legal trouble, because like that whole thing with Maya Angelou, when the horrible experience she went through where the guy ended up getting killed by her family for rib and there's so many things that happen with it, but also they've seen how you react to women coming forward. They've yeah. seen and heard the things you say about other women on the TV or that this or that. And that's what so, Me Too is really about changing. You know, again, in The mm -hmm. Keepers, one of the women who was a victim of this priest um, never told anybody. She was too ashamed. And yeah. when uh, Jane Doe came forward in the 1990s to say that she had been sexually abused, she said it, it became big news in the Baltimore newspapers because that's where, where it happened. Yeah. And her, she would sit around, you know, like at family gatherings and people and her own family would say, isn't it terrible the lies this woman is making up about, you know, this poor priest. And she's sitting there going, he abused me too. And so how can I possibly tell you that yeah. he did this to me when you don't believe someone and you're disparaging her. You're just going to say the same things about me. Everyone else is going to say the same thing about me. And that's really mm -hmm. what me is about changing. It is about that reflexive, no, I don't believe it until you prove it with pictures or something. And even then, you know, you can have men beating women on videotape. Um, <laughs> so, um, <laughs> just, yeah, you do everything right and you will still get screwed over. I, yeah there isn't a way to like that that's what that's what really gets me of like the actual video proof because people are still people are still defending quentin tarantino they will defend quentin tarantino people are still defending bill cosby like yeah. I, i'm sorry it's like you can't here's what really gets me too gets me too haha uh, but is how many victims do you need to be believed? I've heard people say like, oh, I mean, well, it's just one, but now with like, you know, 10 or 20 people saying it. One of the tweets I sent out was um, the Harvey Weinstein, you know, victim response chart. Uh, one woman, um, she's lying. It's he said, she said. Yep. Five women, she's, they're lying. Uh, you know, 35 women, why didn't you say something sooner? Oh my God, that's too much tea. And then if it's 75, <laughs> they're doing yeah. it for money and getting a class action lawsuit. That's because, it. Then, yeah. Because you know, if, like I said, um, I, it's amazing to me of how many victims need to be there. Do we do that with murder? Right. Yeah. Do we do right. all the only hit drunk, drunk drive and hit that family one time? I, one time. No, are you kidding me? It's, and like I said, like, some of the things that we actually could have prevented if if domestic abuse because i think dom obviously domestic abuse is very much tied with um i think sexual harassment and sexual assault mm -hmm. uh even if it isn't sexual i like i said i think it's like the whole thing with power but yes. one of the things like i said that i notice if um once the word sex comes in or sexual assault of anything like it if I said that I was hit by somebody, let's say I'm talking to a friend, just without, they're going to be, oh my God, are you okay? What happened? You know, it, if I say I was hit on my ass or my breast was grabbed, basically, you know, mm -hmm. it's, oh, well, uh, I mean, that stinks. I didn't know. Like, that's most of the response that you get. Don't you remember all those people asking Richard Spencer, why did you put your face there if you didn't want it punched? <laughs> oh, Richard. Oh, my little Duke educated Nazi.
All right, guys, I am going to cut off the interview here because we went for about two hours. It is a long amount of time, and so I'm going to break this up into two sections. Part two of this will appear in a future show. And with that, I guess all that's left to be said is that I've been Christy. You have been awesome. Thank you so much for your time and attention, and I'll see you all again really soon. Bye-bye.